uh, a very different uh, state cup in 2020. We've still got a few more people um, joining us. So we'll just we'll give everyone a couple more minutes before we start. There's, there's a whole rush of people coming in right now. Right, there's still uh, a few people coming in, but we don't necessarily want to keep everyone here all evening. So we will start the session. Uh, as you come in, for those of you who have turned your videos and microphones off, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'd ask you all to keep those off during the session as we move through tonight. Um, The State of Play session tonight is all about the State Cup and it's going to focus on updating everyone in relation to the change format and access points that we need to follow to run the 2020 State Cup in this change COVID environment uh, and the protocols that are placed upon us in relation to the need to present the event in a format that is being accepted by the government in relation to our submission to allow the event to continue this year. We'll go through a number of different phases. And again, this tonight's session is all about the COVID protocols. Uh, we'll talk about the format, um, the access points, the zone passes, designated parking areas, uh, the addendums to the conditions of entry uh, and breaches and opportunities. And at the end of the session, there will be time uh, for people to ask any questions that you may wish to ask. I would ask you, however, as we're going through to pop those questions in the chat function of Zoom, uh, then being monitored by staff, and then we can loop back to them when we get to uh, the end of the presentation. So yes, the games are on. Uh, we received notice on the 21st of October uh, from the Minister to give us to run the State Cup in four discrete areas. Each of those areas can have no more than 500 participants in them at any one time. Uh, it's essential throughout the whole event that social distancing and the four square metre rule applies, uh, along with physical separation of the zones that we are, have been granted to run with. That's a really important factor that we must maintain that separation and we must maintain the current social distancing protocols that are in place right across society. Uh, through Vorden Cup, we were audited three times by the New South Wales Health Department in relation to the way that we're running the events. Uh, and we know already, and been advised already, that those protocols will be again audited at some stage through the course of the State Cup. So it is really important that all our participants maintain those protocols throughout the course of the event. Now, while it was really pleasing to be able to kick off the State Cup and say, yes, we're going ahead, uh, based on the fact that we had got the government exemption, it does have an obvious impact on the way that we can deliver the event and the structure of the event. 
Being such a large venue, our application needed to consider how we move people on and off the venue to ensure that we've only got 500 in each discrete zone at any one time. It also had to make sure that we were not having people move across different zones. The net effect of that is that we will lose 13 hours of playing time throughout the course of the three days to be able to deliver the event within the protocols that have been set to us. Hence why between playing the games in sections, we have a large turnover time, firstly to move people off the venues and then to bring people back on the venues while nobody is on the venue. In any normal year, we'd probably have around 6,000 people wandering Tuffins Lane. Uh, and the regional stadium and West Tuffins. This year, under the current public health orders, the maximum anyone would be able to have would be 500. So getting the government exemption to allow us to have the three, the four discrete zones means that we can at any one time have 2,000 people on the venue as long as we are obeying the rules and regulations that are put in place around those protocols and around those discrete areas. When we talk about the number of 500 people in each of those areas, we have to remember that includes participants, it includes team management, it includes all the referees, it includes all the event staff, all the event volunteers, the catering crew, the cleaning crew, the council employees needed to be on site during the event. So all calculations need to be made ensuring that we've taken into account all those different members of our community who are going to be present over the course of the three days. It, it means that our numbers add up very quickly uh, and the all four discrete zones have a different makeup of fields, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And while some zones are smaller, we need to apply the same mechanism across all zones. And so that means that we, when we're doing our count of numbers, regardless of how many fields might be in that zone, we still need to consider the impact of all the infrastructure and human resourcing that are needed to go into the running of the event are counted in those numbers in that discrete zone at any one time. With this year's format, it is are definitely under the arrive, play and leave protocol. We will be playing them in sections, which means teams are going to be playing back to back. Um, we have tried to look after the men's 50s, men's 55s and men's 60s to try and give those a break. Teams are not to enter the venue through their allocated areas until 40 minutes prior to their first game. If you arrive to the checkpoints earlier than that, you will not be allowed onto the venue. You will not be allowed to move your vehicles into Tuffins Lane if you've got minibuses. And you won't be allowed to come through the access points, which will be manned by security, until that 40 minute zone prior to your games. All games will be played as a 25 minute turnaround which means teams will have five minutes to move from their field that they've just finished on to their new field before the game starts. We will ask you all to move quickly. We don't have the luxury of waiting for teams to be able to move to their field and be ready to play. The hooter will go on the half hour every half hour. And if the teams aren't ready, the games will go ahead. You are to leave the venue immediately after you've completed your sectional round games. There are to be no debriefs on the venue or the car park. Again, to be clear, because unfortunately, this is something that our community seems not to take note of during Vorden Cup and country championships. There are to be no debriefs after the games on the venue or in the car park. All teams must have vacated the area within 30 minutes of their last game. That means you need to be off the fields, have moved back to your vehicles and moved off the um, venue within 30 minutes of the completion of your game. 
with the arrive play leave protocol, as we get through the event, our numbers do decrease. And while it's really disappointing for us as an organisation that we are, cannot allow the spectators to be participants this year, we will allow teams, once we reach the quarterfinal stage, to remain on the venue in their sections and in their zones once they have finalised their game. So if you're in the quarterfinal and you happen to lose, you will be able to stay on that venue and on that zone to watch the completion of the, the semifinals and final series, should you wish. In mixed B, we will also permit the teams in the pool B to stay on the venue Saturday if they wish between their 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. games. They have an extra two rounds that they need to, come to play uh, because of the structure of their draw. And we do know that that game will finish at 3.25. We will allow the mixed P B pool game, uh, teams to remain on the venue, but they must stay within the zone. The structure of the event for this year will have men's A with two pools. They'll play quarterfinals, semifinals and grand finals. Uh, the women's open A will play two pools plus pre, two predetermined crossover games with the opposing pool and still have finals, semifinals and grand finals. The mixed open will have three pools. The top two teams from each pool will progress to the um, series for the championship and with the third and fourth place teams progressing to the 16 final series for the plate. Men's B will have two pools uh, in the championship. They'll play quarterfinals, semifinals and grand finals. And then in the plate division, there will also be two pools with a quarterfinal, semifinal and grand final. Women's B will set up in the same fashion. There'll be two pools for the championship, again, playing quarterfinals, semifinals and grand finals. And the plate, two pools again, quarterfinals, semifinals and grand finals. For both the men's and women's 20s, uh, with the numbers of nominations, we will have three pools. The top two teams from each pool and the best ranked seventh and eighth team will progress through to the quarterfinals and then play semifinals and grand finals. Uh, the men's 30s will play one pool. They'll have a semifinal and grand final. The women's 30s will play one pool with semifinal and grand final. The mixed senior and pool with final and grand final. Men's 40s will play two pools with a quarterfinal, semifinal and grand final. The women's 40s will play one pool with a semifinal and grand final. The mixed masters will play one pool with semifinal and grand final. The men's 50s will play one pool with a semifinal and grand final. The men's 55s will play one pool and the top two teams will play in the grand final. They'll play each other twice. Uh, we have had a couple of teams pull out of that division, which has dropped it down to three now. So they will play each other twice, as will the uh, men's 60s rather than the men's 60s. Uh, they'll play each other in one pool, but they'll play each other twice, and the top two teams will progress to the grand final. Venue set up in the four zones. Zone one will be the stadium. They'll have two fields in there. Zone two is Tuffins Lane, airport side. So that's all the fields on the airport side of the pathway that divides the venue. And zone three will be Tuffins Lane, creek side. That's the five fields closest to the creek behind where the pathway that splits the venue goes. And West Tuffins is zone four, which has 12 fields. You can see there on the screen now uh, the, how the three zones are broken up. And we'll talk a little bit later about the uh, security checkpoints and where people can come on and off the venue, depending on what zones they are playing in. As we discussed earlier, uh, all the zones are going to be played in sections. Zones two, three, and four will be played in four sections on Friday and Saturday. Section one will commence at 8 a.m. 
and the last game will finish at 9.25. Section two will commence at 11 a.m. with the last game finishing at 12.25. Section three will commence at 2 p.m. with the last game commencing or finishing at 3.25. And section four will commence at 5 p.m. And, commence, and finish at 6.25. That slide gives you a, a quick look at how the game split up and you will note there for the men's 50s, we've been able to present them with a games break as well as with the men's 55s and men's 60s. So they're not playing three games back to back, they're playing two games with a break. Um, some other divisions have got two games back to back and some have the three games back to back. For zones two, three, and four, Sunday's games will also be played in four sections. However, due to the reducing amount of numbers on the venue as we get down to quarterfinals and the final series, our changeover times diminish. So section one will play at 8 a.m. through to 9.25. Section two will commence at 11 a.m. and play through to 12.25. Section three will commence at 1.30 and play through to 2.25, and section four will commence at 3 p.m. and be finished by 3.25. Again, that just gives you a look on Sunday's grid and the way that the games pan out with the required changeover times as we move into last rounds on Sunday morning, uh, then into the quarterfinals from section two onwards. Section zone one needs to be played in a block because they only have two fields in that zone. Uh, men's A and women's A will be playing in there on Friday and Saturday. On Friday, the first block will be men's A commencing at 8 a.m. and they'll play through to 1.55 p.m. Then there'll be a change over time uh, for block two where the women's A will come on and they'll play through to 7.55 p.m. that night under lights. And on the Saturday, we will swap that over. 8 a.m. to 10.55 a.m. will be the women's A. And then from 11.30 a.m. to 7.25 p.m. will be the men's A. Again, that gives you a look at how the setup is for the games on Friday and Saturday a smaller time zone to move people on and off. That is because due to the block format, those teams that finish their games in round three at 12 o'clock, so they commence at 12 o'clock, they'll be finished at 12.30, are required to move straight off the venue. Uh, so as they finish their rounds in their blocks, they are, meant, they are leaving the venue. On Sunday, you will see uh, the way that it pans out there are final round games for the women's A, then a changeover period uh, before they start their quarterfinals, the men's quarterfinals, the men's 55s and men's 60s grand finals, women's A semifinals, men's A semifinals, the women B championships semifinals, mixed open grand final, women's open A grand final, men's open champ B championship grand final, Men's Open A Grand Final and Women's Open B Championship Grand Final. We're talking about the access points. For Zone 1, the stadium, the only, it is only accessible from the front gates. So you will come in as per normal from the front entry of the stadium, and that's the only accessible entry into that venue. It's only accessible to the teams playing in that zone the referees, or are those people who are holding access passes, as well as infrastructure support staff. Zone two, airport side, is only accessible from P1 and P2 entry points and P8 for the minibuses. It's only accessible to the teams who are playing in that zone, to the referees, and to those holding access passes and infrastructure support staff. Zone three, which is Tuffins Lane Creek side, is only accessible from P1 and P2 entry points 
and the P8 for minibuses. Only accessible to play teams playing in that zone and referees of that zone holding and anyone holding an access pass and infrastructure support crew. Zone four, which is West Tuffins, is only accessible from P1, P2 entry point and behind West Tuffins for minibuses. It's only accessible for teams playing in the zone, referees or those holding access passes and infrastructure support staff. Please note there is no pedestrian access via Tuffins Lane at all. If we have a look at Zone 1, if you follow the green line, here is the stadium. This is P5, which is the parking area we'll talk about shortly, and a P3, which is the parking area for all referees and all participants playing in the Zone 1. They'll come out and enter through the normal front gate here. Important to note, there is no access from zone one across the bridge of the creek out onto Tuffins Lane. That is only accessible to referees or persons who hold an access pass or the event infrastructure support team. For zone two, which is airport side Tuffins, if you have a minibus for your team, you will be able to take that minibus down Tuffins Lane. And on the left-hand side, there are two car parks, the second of which is P8. You will be able to park your minibus in P8 and move directly into zone two. So again, if you have a minibus and you're playing in zone two, you can bring that down Tuffins Lane and park it in P8 and move directly into zone two. If you are coming by a car, you can only park in P1 or P2, and you enter through the security checkpoint at the base of P1. You will enter through that checkpoint and go straight onto the fields for zone two. If you're playing in zone three, Tuffins Creek side, and you are in a minibus, again, you can bring that minibus down Tuffins Lane and park in P7, which is the first car park on your left, and you can access directly into zone three. If you are coming by car, you must park in P1 or P2. You must enter through the security checkpoint and follow the blue line as it is on this map. It's not a blue line on the fields, but it will be fenced and um, also bunted. You will follow that down to the security point where you will enter into zone two, the zone three, sorry. When you leave, that is exactly the same way you leave. You go back out through the security checkpoints, back out into P1. Or if you're in a minibus, you can jump straight in your bus there and exit. Most easily accessible are P7 for minibuses for zone three and P8 for minibuses for zone two. If you are in zone four, West Tuffins, and you have a minibus, you are able to bring your minibus down Tuffins Lane to the very end and turn right in behind West Tuffins and park there and access zone four. If you are coming in a car, you would be parked in P1 or P2. You will enter through the security checkpoint and you will follow the fenced walkway, which is being constructed that will take you down to West Tuffins and you will enter into West Tuffins to play your games. When you leave, you will exit via the same motion. You will come out of there, you will follow the fenced walkway, back down to the security checkpoint, out in the P1, P2, and then your vehicle and leave. If you have a minibus, you will be able to jump in your minibus and leave and exit down Tuffins Lane. So with the access points and team movement and zone movement, Teams and team management, when you arrive at the venue, you are to move directly to your zone and you must remain in that zone until you are scheduled to leave. On leaving, you must 
move directly off the venue from your zone. You cannot hang around. You must move directly off. We've had 30 minutes allocation to move everyone off the area, back to their cars, back to their minibuses and move them out so we can bring the next group of players in. Teams and team management are not permitted, not permitted to cross zones or enter other zones. You must remain in the zone that you have been allocated for that time frame, that section. If you're involved in more than one team, such as if you're playing in one team and have a coaching role in another, if both teams are participating in the same section in different zones, you can only remain with one of those teams for the full section. You cannot jump in and out. You must remain with one of those teams for the full section. If they are playing in different sections, and so I might be playing in section one, but I might be coaching in section three. I am permitted to exit the venue from one zone, if I'm in zone two, and my next game is in zone four, I can exit the venue from zone two, leave the venue with my team and come back with my second team at that later sectional time and re-enter the venue. That is permissible. It is not permissible if your teams are playing in the same section time, but if they are in different section times, you must leave the venue and re-enter to go into the new zone. You can't cross from one zone into another zone. Even if you are playing in section one and your second team is in section two, you must move out of the venue from section one and come back on the venue in section two. There will be security at the checkpoints uh, on the venue this year, and that's an unfortunate step we have had to take due to the lessons we've learned through Vorden Cup and country championships. Um, I'll be totally frank and honest with you. I thought that our community was disgraceful in the way that they treated staff and volunteers through Vorden Cup and country championships, and that we're not going to place our staff in that position. Uh, some of the abuse that they copped when all they were trying to do was put an event on for people to play in was totally unacceptable. So not only will they not be um, put in a situation, hopefully, where that occurs, if it does occur, then strong action will be taken against those clubs, those individuals and those teams. Because through Vorden Cup and through country championships, it was all three. It was abuse from a club. It was abuse from teams. It was abuse from individuals. This is a different world we live in. The way we are presenting this particular State Cup is not the way we want to. It's not the traditional State Cup that we want to present. It is the State Cup we have to present if you want to play, because that is simply the alternative. The alternative is not to play. Unfortunately, because of what's happened through Vorden and through country championships, we will have security manning those access points. Affiliate coordinators, each affiliate has an affiliate coordinator and if their affiliate has more than three teams, now because of the, the length of the days and the size of the event, we're allowing those affiliates to have two affiliate coordinators. Each of those will have an access pass. That will allow affiliate coordinators to move between zones throughout the day. Uh, those access paths must be on display at all times for the security, uh, hence why we ask the affiliate coordinators also to give us their um, headshots to place on those access passes. The affiliate coordinators will also be wearing a vest provided by New South Wales Touch, and you must be wearing that while you're on the fields so you are easily identifiable both to security and staff, and including our volunteers who are coming along to help at this particular event. Um, we will need one affiliate coordinator at the fields at all time while your teams are playing. Um, some affiliate coordinators have misunderstood that they have to be there the whole day. If you've got one team and that team's playing in section one, you only have to be there while the team is on the venue. You don't have to be there for the whole day. While your club has teams present, then we would like one affiliate coordinator present. 
The passes and the vests can be picked up from the stadium on Thursday uh, from 12 noon to 6 p.m. Uh, if you just come to the stadium as you would normally do, uh, making sure that we observe all the social distancing protocols, and you'll be able to pick up both those passes uh, as well as your car pass and the vests that we will require you to wear across the weekend. We would ask you to return those vests at the end of the event uh, and remembering that you do have access to move amongst the different zones and we'll have to take down both for contact tracing as well as um, being able to contact people in emergency situations, uh, the names and mobile uh, and email addresses for those people. Parking, I've already alluded to in some of the commentary about where different areas will park. If you are in zone one, or if you are a referee, your parking area is P3. This is a new parking area and it's directly just past the stadium on your right hand side. It's often, many people have often probably driven past it and looked at that vacant ground and said, why don't New South Wales touch um, using that as a car park to uh, relief some of the stress of parking at the venue. Uh, that, that area has been previously owned by an individual who wasn't willing to allow us to use it as parking. Uh, it has now been bought out by the Catholic Church uh, at Port Macquarie, who we have a very strong relationship with, and they are allowing us to use that area uh, this year for car parking, which will be for all the teams that play in the stadium zone as well as all the referees. If you own a minibus or you're bringing a minibus for zone one, this will be parked in the regular minibus zone, which is directly in front of the stadium hill. For zone two, Tuffins Lane Airport side, for section one and three, we will be, through our traffic management plan, we'll be bringing cars into P1. If you're in section two or section four, we'll be bringing cars in to P2. That will be managed by the traffic management company engaged by New South Wales Touch to uh, run the traffic plan uh, and they will monitor how that manoeuvring goes. If you have a mini bus, as I said, you can enter via Tuffins Lane and that vehicle will be parked in P8 and you can directly enter zone two from P8. For Tuffins Lane, the Creekside, again, section, if you're playing in section one or section three, you'll park in P1. If you're par playing in sections two or four, you'll be in P2, but again, that will be managed by the company that we've engaged for traffic management. Mini buses for zone three will come down Tuffins Lane and park in P7. That's the first car park on your left, and you'll be able to enter directly into that zone, zone three, from that P7 car park. If you're playing in West Tuffin, zone four, again, sections one and three will park in P1, section two and four will park in P2, again, managed by the traffic management company. Mini buses for zone four can proceed down the length of Tuffins Lane, and when you get to the end, you'll be able to turn right, drive in and park behind the fields. For mini buses in stadium, here's the stadium fields here. This is the section here, P6, for mini bus parking. For, P, uh, for zone three and zone two, as you come down the Tuffins Lane, first on your left will be zone three parking, P7, and second on your left will be mini bus parking for P8 for zone two. And as we said, you can come all the way down the end of Tuffins Lane, turn right in behind West Tuffins there for zone four and park minibuses along there in P9. For referees in zone one access, you'll come down Boundary Street past the entrance to the stadium. And then there is the entry point to P3. You'll be able to go in and park in this particular area before making your way back down here and into the stadium.
P1 and P2 are located again down Boundary Street towards the airport. You turn right into Tuffins Lane and you move down there under the guidance of the traffic management company to be put into P1 or P2. You'll then make your way down to the bottom of P1 where the bridge is that takes you over into Tuffins Lane where the security checkpoint will be or the fence line taking you all the way up to West Tuffins Zone 4. For the officials, pass holders, and the affiliate coordinators who will get a car pass, P5 is your area of the park. You'll come in off Boundary um, Road into here and be directed to park into this particular area. And then you'll be able to make your way either in the stadium or you can, because you're a um, access pass holder, make your way down the, the roadway across the bridge and out onto Tuffins Lane. Access points for toilets, canteens and water. We'll start at the top of the page. Uh, we will be bringing in extra portal loose as well for the different zones. But if you're in zone four, uh, you will have a toilet block here. Uh, and there we've council are putting in a water solution for people to be able to refill bottles, as well as the canteen area, which is located here. If you are in P3, the toilet block is the block that is allocated between P7 and P8. So if you're in zone three, that's your toilet block there. There is water access on the back of the tower building and you will split the canteen. There'll be two windows for the canteen open, one opening up out onto P, oh, sorry, out onto zone two and one opening up out on zone three. They will be physically separated by bunting or fence line. So you won't be able to um, crossover, but you will be able to have access to that canteen. If you're in um, zone two, there will be water access near the tower area and your toilet block is down the bottom end towards the creek. And that is the two accessible places for you if you are in P2. The stadium, there are toilet facilities in the uh, amenities block that is located uh, just behind tournament control or actually in the stadium grandstand itself. The canteens will be operating, but it won't be the normal catering that people are used to at state cups. Um, there will be three canteens in the one servicing, split servicing zones two and three, one over in zone four and one in the stadium. Uh, they will all stock drinks, water, Powerade soft drinks. They'll also have large water. Uh, they'll be stocking wraps, assorted lollies, chips and ice. The stadium canteen will also have bacon and egg rolls, pies and sausage rolls, but we're led to believe from Paul Macquarie Touch who have the catering that will only be available in the stadium area. Reminders around the addendum to give us the ability to run these events and a part of our permissions from government that we need to maintain and follow. It's incumbent on everybody who's participating that they have an obligation to make sure that they are keep themselves informed of where the hotspots are and any exposures to these locations. Everyone has an obligation to protect not just the health and well-being of themselves, but also their team, their affiliate, our touch football community, but also the, the community at large in Port Macquarie that we are now um, being enveloped into for the running of this event. All our participants, all our officials, all our referees, everyone must follow all public health order instructions and acknowledge that this may put participation in jeopardy. Um, everything at the moment looks fantastic uh, in New South Wales. We've seen in other states how that can quickly change. And while we've got the go ahead right now, um, something could happen this week that might put our event in jeopardy. If anyone in your team, your affiliate or your grouping is a subject to a public health order, they must not participate. 
they cannot, if they're subject to a public health order, which is telling them that they have to isolate and get tested, they cannot participate in the state cup or interact with members of their team or fill it such time as have been medically cleared and authorised to re-engage. Reminder to everyone, if you're not feeling well, don't attend. If, you, uh, if you're either games or training, if you, if you feel crook, you must seek a medical clearance before returning. Go and get tested and make sure that you're not putting anyone in jeopardy. If anyone in your affiliate, your team or your grouping in the last 14 days has had contact with a known or suspected case of COVID-19 or have returned from an identified hotspot, they must not attend and they must seek medical clearance before returning. Our medical staff will be on duty, but they will not be providing pre-game treatments or strapping. Our medical staff will only be providing uh, in-game injury treatment, similar to what we've had in place for both Ford and Cup and, and the country championships. We need to ask all team management to ensure that there are no Hands in huddles, no high fives, no post-game handshakes. It goes against everything we do as a sport, but right now it's something that we need to put in place. Of note, Vorton Cup started well uh, with teams acknowledging each other across the, across the fields at the end of the games. Uh, but we did note as the, the year went on with Vorton Cup, Team started to become more engaging. There was the handshakes, there was the high fives, there was the cuddling. We just have to ask you not to do that. Like I said, it goes against the fabric of what we do as a sport. But at the moment, we need to make sure that there are no hands in huddles, no high fiving, no post game handshakes. Make sure that every individual has their own water bottle. No one has to be sharing water bottles. Uh, and we also want everyone to bring their own individual hand sanitizers to all games, both for pre and post game use. Make sure if you're bringing towels to the venue that each individual has their own towel and they do not share this at any time. Uh, or they can't share any piece of equipment that the virus may be transmitted upon. Again, all team management and all the team officials will at all times wear a surgical mask or equivalent when in the substitution area. The mask must be worn correctly, covering the mouth and not below the chin. Now, I will say this, we had a lot of trouble with this through our events. We understand it's not comfortable for people. Right at this point in time, this is part of the, um, us getting the go ahead to run the event. We are, however, aware that late last week, there were some alterations within the health industry around protocols of wearing masks. We're seeking clarification at this point in time to see how that may or may not impact on our regulations and our approval to run the event. If it is that we are allowed to not wear masks, we will advertise that to everybody. As it stands right now, we don't have that clarification. So as it stands right now, you are required to wear a mask. However, that may change during the course of this week. As soon as we have clarification, we will notify everybody about that. We need to remind the, the team management to make sure that they bring hand sanitizers or sanitizer spray. Uh, and you make sure that you sanitize all your touch balls prior to the warm up. Sanitize all your touch footballs post warm up. Ensure that the match ball has been sanitized before tap off and sanitize the match ball post game. Also, if there's any other equipment used in warm ups, such as witches hats or anything like that, they need to be sanitized both pre and post warm up. And if only we would ask that only one person be tasked with the setting up and collection and handling of that warm up equipment. Again, talking about the minimization of uh, contacting. Um, if players want to wear sports gloves, they are permitted. Uh, again, there's no huddles, but do not observe social distancing. 
So if you do have your tombs in the hull, try and keep them that 1.5 metres apart from each other. No high fives, no post-game handshakes. Um, we advise that on the communication of November 5, that because of what happened at Voiden Cup and Country Championships, if individuals or teams or affiliates breach the rules that we put in place to run the event or they disobey direction by New South Wales officials, then action will be taken. This may be, but not limited to suspension, have points deducted, games deemed as forfeits, be removed from the competition or be fined. It may sound harsh and it is, but I'll point to two things. One, we're not gonna put up and put staff in a position of what took place through what I only describe as individual selfishness through our previous two events, Void and Cup and Country Championships. Some of the comments made to staff bordered on disgusting. The way that affiliates and teams from some affiliates just thumbed their nose at what was put in place so we could get permission for them to play the game just bordered on just total disrespect. It would be very easy for us just not to have run the State Cup and then nobody plays. But the other big thing for us right now is we have on the horizon the Junior State Cups and we know that the New South Wales Health are going to come onto the venue and observe what we are doing. If we still have individuals who are nothing more than selfish and want to do their own thing, you need to make them aware that they are putting in jeopardy the Junior State Cups. Because if our community is seen to do the wrong thing while we are being audited by New South Wales Health, then there is no way in Hades we will get permission or exemptions to run the Junior State Cups. The other thing we did advise, this year is totally different to any other. Um, I'll be totally honest, I'm personally saddened by the fact that we can't have people hang around the venue. We can't catch up with people we haven't seen for 12 months. We can't sit in our tents and swap lies of how good I played last game or the try I scored from five metres out eventually turned out from 70 metres out. We have to obey what's in place. So that means people are going to have a lot longer away from the fields than we would normally have. So that's an opportunity for us, well, not for staff, unfortunately, but for the rest of our community to explore Port Macquarie. A lot of people who play our game more than likely have attended the venue. They know the fields. They know Panthers. They know the motel they stay in. They know their favourite restaurants. But they haven't actually looked any further afield. Because of the game, the downtime away from the venue, um, there's plenty of opportunities. And there's a link there, portmacquarieinfo.com.au, which can, you can look at and have a look at the different options that you may wish to undertake. Um, I'm nearly at the end of this presentation. Before I get to the end, um, we also want to just make everyone aware, solve the problem uh, as we go. Unfortunately, um, a local gave some information to the ground staff around the new edition, um, eighth edition rules which has meant that uh, some incorrect lines have been marked for fields. Uh, unfortunately, when they marked these lines, uh, they also treated that um, line marking with an agent that would kill the grass. So there are some issues that we have at the moment with incorrect line markings. We are trying to find a solution uh, for that to be alleviated. Um, but I just want to make everyone aware now that that is the case rather than you arrive on Thursday or Friday and go, well, what the hell is going on? Uh, hopefully we have it solved by then, um, but uh, we may not have it solved by then. Um, again, if you've got any, if you want information about COVID, um, you can go to our webpage on our COVID page or the Touch Football Australia COVID return to play webpage. 
uh, and there's all the information around COVID and our return to play protocols. Uh, at this point, before I open up or let the staff let me know of any questions that come through, I might just ask either Kylie Hearn or Ben Williams, who are in charge of running the event, if they have any comments that they want to add on at this point or anything that I may not have covered. I will, Dean, very quickly. Um, just to let people know that in um, Zone 4, with the toilet block at the back, we know in previous years that there has always been a pump issue. So we have organised quite a large number of extra toilets, which will go at either ends of the venue. From a lesson learnt at Vorden Cup, where people would want to come onto the venue to use the toilets when they got there early. Um, we have toilets being placed in the car park as well. So in that P1 and P2, so there will be port loos in those toilets as well. With the taps that Dean spoke about on the tower, um, they there is two, so one for each zone. So you don't need to cross either. So, um, there's, so thank you to Port Council who have installed them separately for us and also for the new tap that's on the other side as well. The other thing that I did say to Dean is that um, the canteen is limited and I do know that there are some teams that have buys in between their games. So um, my advice is, you know, if you're going to bring a backpack, pack things that you would normally pack like snacks and, you know, nuts and fruit and stuff like that because with the arrive, play and leave, that's exactly what it is. So the canteen is not stocking things that they believe they're going to completely sell out of. It's very minimal. Um, you know, um, like Dean had up there, it's just chips and, you know, sausage rolls and pies and that sort of stuff. So um, just be smart about what you um, want to pack and um, and bring in to the, to the venue. So that was the only thing that I sort of really wanted to mention. Oh, sorry, as well. Um, We've been asking, there's some questions about picking up team balls. So we have balls. So um, on Thursday, when affiliates want to come and get their car passes, um, teams can come down and pick up their team ball if they like. We will hand it to you sanitised. You'll see us sanitise it. Um, we'll hand it to you with gloves, much like we did at Boarding Cup and Country Champs. The same process. So um, you can come down. All we ask is that you QR when you come down, just so we have a contact tracing. Um, Port Macquarie people, and I will say this speaking to council, they are very protective of their area because they have had no COVID cases for six to seven months. Um, and as I've tried to say to Port Macquarie as well, um, that we are fully aware of that and we will do everything in our power that we can to make sure that because we come from Sydney area and, you know, Greater Sydney um, that sort of stuff where there has been cases and, you know, knock on wood, there hasn't been cases for so long now, but we will do everything that we can to ensure that the community is safe. New South Wales Touch, this is the very first event that has been ran here since COVID. So no other sport, they've not allowed any other sport to come back here. Um, the Ironman wasn't here, nothing. This is the first sport. So they are very, very hesitant um, and very protective of how things done. And that goes back to um, at your hotels as well. So um, your hotels have limited numbers in your pooling area. So those who normally would go back to the pools and, you know, um, do recoveries, the suggestion there is that you go to the beach and do that because um, a lot of hotels up here will not have um, large numbers allowed in their pool areas and um, they uh, will ask you that you monitor that. So just keep that in mind as well. So um, that was all I wanted to say, but I do have some questions, Dean, that have been coming up on here. So one of them okay. is about... So just before, Kyle, just, yep. just to follow up on that last point around um, your accommodation and pools. Uh, every accommodation place, doesn't matter if it's in Port Macquarie or anywhere across New South Wales, uh, they have to have COVID protocols in place as well. Uh, and we are aware that New South Wales Health has been around to the accommodation houses in Port Macquarie because they know this event is coming up. 
and reminded all the accommodation houses to be compliant with their COVID safety plans. So I don't think it'll just be uh, the venue that will be audited. Uh, I think there'll be auditing going on right across the, the town. Um, because like I said, this is the first major event that has run in this area uh, since COVID broke back in March. Uh, so there is a, there is a, uh, nervousness, it'd be fair, um, not from our point of view, but from some elements uh, of the local community um, about that. So um, did Ben want to add anything or is he fine? No, I'm all good. I'm pretty sure you both have covered that off really well. That's everything covered. Okay. Um, so, Carl's, I've got the chat up so I can just run through those and then if any others come up. So the first one there is about the in the men's a a three hour gap uh, between games and if they're able to leave the venue. Uh, my initial point to that is that that is something that is possibly we can allow. We're just taking advice at the moment from New South Wales Health on that, uh, but because of the way uh, the section or zone one sets up, I think that they'll be okay with that. Uh, but we just, we're just waiting for the final advice, but we will go to all the teams in men's and women's A about that situation um, in the next 24 hours. Uh, a question from Craig May. So we're walking from our hotel to play on West Tuffins and we can't get into Tuffins Lane by walking. How do we? So the entry point for West Tuffins will be through P1 and P2. Is a Toyota Tarago considered a minibus? Um, yeah, I suppose from a from a traffic management perspective, uh, I think we might allow um, a Tarago because it is, I suppose, in some ways a, a bus, but I suppose SUVs and things of that nature are not really. But um, again, we'll come back to you on that, Mitchell. We'll just take advice from the traffic management company on that. I'll scroll down. If a club has two coordinators, is one coordinator able to pick up the vest and passes for both? Uh, yeah, I would think we would allow that if, if one can't make it on in that timeline, uh, but the one person will need to sign for both and have all the details for both. Uh, where will this, uh, so you've answered that, Kylie, where will this PowerPoint be available for those who haven't been a part of this meeting? So that uh, Kylie said they'll upload this uh, to the State Cup website and ensure affiliate coordinators advise their teams. Uh, another question about the coordinator not being able to pick up the vest. So we've answered that, Sandy, that yet yeah, someone can come in and pick it up. Um, but we just need to take details, obviously, of who comes in to pick that up and get the details of the coordinator if we don't already have them. If you have a buy in the second game, can you stay within your section? Yes. Yeah. So um, it's actually when that question started, Darren, I thought it was going to go the other way and asking if you had a buy, can you move out and come back? Now, if you have a buy in the second game, um, you must actually stay within your section till the third game. Uh, you won't be able to move out of the section and come back in. So if everyone's clear on that, if you have a buy in the, the second game, in a three-game block or a three-game section, you must stay within your um, zone and play until your third game. If you are finished after two games, you can move out and move off the venue. Uh, Ada Catalan has asked, will there be a drop-off zone near each entry point? Unfortunately, Ada, the way the venue sets up, there, there are no drop-off points. Um, hence why we, right from the get-go, when we got permission, encouraged affiliates to use minibuses for their teams because that is the most easily accessible point uh, for each of the zones. Uh, so we would suggest still doing that if possible. Uh, otherwise, uh, if, if I'm a parent and I'm bringing my child, um, I'd have to park in the, the zone, walk them down on to the venue. I can't walk them onto the venue. Um, and but teams obviously would have to be organising for team management to take care of that. Um, Mary Watchman's asked, do coaches and managers wear masks and have a pass? 
Um, coaches and managers at this point in time do wear a mask. Now, like I said earlier, we are taking advice uh, from the health experts uh, based on uh, some movement from amber to green protocols late last week. Um, and the coaches do not have a pass, no. Uh, Kim Solomon's asked, in zone one, there is 35 minutes between the end of the morning session and the start of the afternoon session. If we're in the afternoon session, can we arrive 40 minutes prior to the start of game one, even though the morning session is running? Yep, we do understand that there is that overlap there. You will be able to do that, Kim, because in the men's block, um, each round is four time slots. And remember in that last round, the teams that play at the first time slot would have already moved off. The teams that play in the second time slot would already have moved off. So eight teams would have already moved off the venue before the, the teams come onto the venue. So that is permissible. And we've calculated that in our numbering. Uh, Mary's asks, do players have a sign on sheet with numbers? Um, no, we due to some of the issues we've experienced with the new my sideline um the the previous pro, uh, process of everyone being issued with registration sheets to fill out the player numbers on those and return those signed by everyone um, we just are un unable to do it this year in the time frame that we have uh, and with some of the problems we're working with TFA to solve on my sideline. Uh, but we have gone out, and Kylie can correct me if I'm wrong here, we have gone out asking all the clubs to provide us with um, the a sheet with the players' names and playing numbers um, for a couple of reasons. Most importantly, our state selectors are on site uh, monitoring players and looking for new players for state of origin. Um, but also, if there are issues, we need to be able to identify players. So is that correct, Carls? Yes. Yep, that is. Okay. Um, so what shelter is allowed in Zone 1? If a team has a physio, can they treat the, uh, at the field? So um, what shelter is allowed in Zone 1? We have said to affiliates that... Uh, because of the nature of playing in blocks in the zone one, rather than uh, the arrive, play and go three games back to back, that affiliates are able to uh, put up a, a small marquee. Uh, it needs to be remembered about the sizing in relation to one person per four square metres. Um, and that we can provide contact details with our uh, tent provider who can assist in that. Uh, so if you make contact with Ben post this meeting, you'll be able to do that. Uh, so yes, you will be able to have uh, a marquee. Uh, they also have the benefit, I suppose, in some respects of being able to sit in the grandstand under a shelter as well. If a team has a physio, can they treat injuries at the field? Uh, yes, they can, as long as that physio is in the 17. So if the coaching management team, if you've got 14 players, and three team management, and one of those is the physio, yep, that's fine. If one of those is not the physio, then they can't be on the venue. Will sub boxes be between five metre lines like Vorden Cup or back to normal? They'll remain uh, at the what was used for Vorden Cup and country championships. So the substitution area is the seven metre line to seven metre line. Um, not the five metre line anymore, Cody. It's seven metre to seven metre. Uh, if your child is on a, in a final on Sunday and under 18, can a parent watch uh, as there won't be as many people on the grounds? Uh, well, that will be dependent on how many people stay at the grounds, Nicole, um, in relation to that particular zone. Uh, and it is difficult for us to manage that process. Uh, and so at this point in time, my answer to that would be no. Um, and if, for example, everyone left, because if you have a look at the zones, um, all those outside fields are in zone, grand finals are in zones two and three, uh, and most fields are being used at the one time slot. So the numbers will be large. Uh, and depending on how many teams hang around to watch the players or games played in their own time slot. 
Um, Kim's asked, is medical available in between games? E.g., if somebody injured themselves during the game, will we be able to seek attention between games? Yep, if that's deemed by the medical staff as uh, an in-game injury, they'll be able to be treated. If it's just something from a long-standing injury that the player has brought into the event, they may not treat that. So if it's a, it's a uh, set up from that point of view, that'll be up to the medical team. Are there medical tents in each zone? Uh, no, there's one major medical tent which they will operate out of, but they will have uh, accessible people in each zone to react quickly should it be needed. If there's no more questions, we've gone five minutes over, which I think is not too bad given the information we wanted to pass on this evening. Um, just want to thank everybody Firstly, for giving up their time this afternoon so we could get this information out to you. Secondly, for um, putting the time and effort in to get teams to the event. And thirdly, in advance of working with us, we know it's not ideal. Um, we know it's not the State Cup that any of us want, but it's the State Cup we've got in 2020 and we just have to make the best of it. And, and like I've said on numerous occasions to different people, there was only one alternative and that alternative was not to play. Um, so we're really pleased that we're able to present it. Uh, we're really pleased that we're able to get it up and running, um, albeit not the way that we want to. So no further questions. Thank you again, everybody. Um, travel safely to Port Macquarie. Um, hopefully we get to see you up there, um, if not at the fields, somewhere around town. Uh, thanks again, everyone.